I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Soft close. You join me inside the 21 Bentley Flying Spur. And this video is gonna be different than usual because I don't just have one flying spur. No, I've got two, both the V8 and W12 models, meaning the only one I'm missing is the new hybrid version. I just can't get my hands on it yet. The Flying Spur though, it's, it's one of the most exclusive four-door sedans money can buy in the company of the Rolls-Royce Ghost and Mercedes Maybach S580. And when you're spending that amount of money on a sedan, practicality and logic, they've got nothing to do with it. It's all about prestige and emotion. So in this in-depth review, we're gonna take a look at the exterior of the W12, the interior of the V8, and then we're gonna drive both of them to see one, if the Flying Spur has the goods, and two, which engine's best? That's today on Miles Per Hour. And there it is, the 21 Bentley Flying Spur. Starting things off with the W12 model here, clad in ice metallic paint. For an extra $6,200, you get this candy coat of white with a luscious metallic flake on the paint surface. This vehicle also has three of Bentley's specification packs, the least expensive of which is the black line that as the name suggests, gives you a lot of gloss black details, like for the grill, the flying bee, the center line, headlight bezels, lower bumper treatments, B, side garnish, window trim, door handles, side accents, taillight bezels, and a couple other details at the rear. We also have the Mulliner specification for $14 plus thousand dollars. It's seen as these 22 inch blacked out wheels on the exterior and a lot more niceties inside the car. These wheels are wrapped in Pirelli P0 tires 275 section front, 315 section rear. The red painted brake calipers are an option as well. 16.5 inch front rotors and 15 inch rear rotors are standard on this Flying Spur W12. And finally, we have the styling specification, which just means carbon fiber. So you get a carbon fiber front splitter, side sill, and rear diffuser plus rear lip spoiler. Spotting that W12 badge means we're looking at the big boy. And what do we think of the white on black? I know it's very in right now, but I wonder how it's gonna age. And I personally would choose one of Bentley's other spectacular exterior colors. They've got an alpine green or a Moroccan blue, both with a cream colored interior. That's me right there. But the white on black definitely gets attention. So if that's, that's what you're going for, this works. But I mean, the vehicle itself gets attention. It's huge. It's 17 feet long. I didn't really appreciate how long the sedan was until I tried to park it in my garage where three row SUVs fit, no problem. This one, couldn't close the door. It's just huge. And it reminds me of, I don't know why, but the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen's car. Okay, I know why, because that thing was so grand and so powerful, and that's what this car is. It's just, it's a monster. Under the hood, on the exterior, it just looks like, hey, I made it. I win in life. You work for me. But it's not just garish, it's, it's elegant, and I think would be more so in a different exterior specification. Do you like the white and black? Let me know in the comments, I'm just curious. At the rear, we've got more blacked out details, including for the oval exhaust ports, the carbon fiber of the styling spec, Bentley spelled out here on the trunk, the Flying B badge in metal, and this is how you open the trunk, you press that B, the carbon fiber of the lip spoiler, strong crease here around the rump going to that rear door, and that kind of picks up with this strong crease going towards the headlights. It's a power. 
power move, right? This car. I dig it. Let's check out that interior now. Ah, uh, but in fact, let's not look at the interior of the W12. No, let's look at the interior of this V8 first edition model. The first edition package is a whopping $55,000 over the standard V8, but I think it might be worth it, as we'll see. And it's not just for these badges or for the metal fuel for the cap, which I do love, that you get with the first edition. No, a lot of that money is well spent on the interior, not on this exterior. This exterior color is called white sand metallic. It costs more money than that ice metallic of the W12, and I don't care what you call it, it's champagne. I can't get excited about a champagne colored car. I can, however, get very excited about this interior. Ooh, hey, did I say cream interior before? I would love that. Well, they got it. They call it linen and the duotone of Brunel, which I call navy, and I love navy leather. So you get two in one, yes, please. The duotone leather is part of that first edition as is the available duotone veneer. And I much prefer this veneer to the piano black, which we know how I feel about piano black, of that W12's interior. This one is pretty spectacular. You get this ash on what they call grand black. I would have gone all the way with either the ash or the open pour koa wood, which Bentley makes available. Ah, that would be so good. But this is still very pleasing to the eye. And this 3D effect to the door panel with this leather that is so exquisite. Here's the process for Bentley in choosing their leather. They have a particular herd that they raise in Northern Europe because the colder climate means fewer flies, fewer bugs, and therefore fewer bites that would otherwise tarnish the quality of the leather. They then hand select the hides from that herd and that's how they make it to the car. That's why it feels so good, so good. And look at these, the cutouts in the leather for the speakers. It's a 19 speaker name sound system, 2200 watts, $8,800. Oh man, but you know it's worth it. As is this headliner, because Bentley didn't just do the microfiber suede thing that all luxury brands do. They went full leather for the headliner. Down the pillars, it's, it's here where no one sees. Here, no one's gonna touch that. Your foot's gonna rub against that. And this one gets me. It's on the back of the door. That's just gonna fold in there. No one's gonna see it, no one's gonna touch it. Bentley just did it because they want their customers to have the full Northern Europe herd leather experience. And I appreciate it. I also appreciate when they use metal in places where you would expect metal, like on the door handle. Listen to that. Oh, it's so satisfying. It's on the window switches for your door mirror controls, around the speaker covers, on the air vents, there in the center console. These things, the leather and the metals and the woods add up. You get these sport pedals as part of the launch edition package. You get the diamond quilting on the seats, embroidered first edition badges on the back. These seats are heated, ventilated, and massaging, of course, as standard on the Flying Spur. Let's hop inside now. and I'm going to start it up because it's warm. Also, because you get to see the rotating display, you get to hear that V8, but you get to see the rotating display, which is a standard feature on the Flying Spur, costs extra as a standalone option, and it doesn't just rotate to a screen from blank wood, it rotates one more time to show you these three analog dials the first is the outside air temperature, the middle is your compass, and the right is a lap timer. I'm not sure why that's here on the Flying Spur, but uh, you have it, and it just looks cool. You get a 12.3 inch touchscreen infotainment as standard on the Flying Spur. My only real complaint about it is that it takes a while to load. Like if the car's been on for a while, it's still loading the display, 
You'll see that in my PV test drives if you watch that. I'm not gonna go super in depth on this or the gauge cluster. If you wanna see that more in depth, watch my walk around video. You do get the ambient lighting as part of the, they call it mood lighting, as part of the first edition package. These tiles you can adjust. You have your navigation system, of course, that's standard. Apple CarPlay and Android Auto are standard. You do have to plug in, and they are regular USB-A ports, not USB-Cs. Got two of them here. Wireless smartphone charging, that's another option. Not part of the first edition package. You get this analog clock here that's beautiful. And I was in the W12, and they had the optional knurled finishes for the air vents around here and here, and for the plungers, yes, plungers, to open and close the flow of the air. And that was pretty awesome. It was pretty cool, next level stuff. You do get neural finishes for the temperature controls down here. Here are your seat heating and cooling. This is all that metal stuff I'm talking about. And for your drive mode selector, we can choose from four drive modes, sport, Bentley mode, comfort, and custom. And turning this feels so satisfying. There's a nice click, a notch when you change the drive mode. The gear selector looks and feels substantial in the hand with that leather strip and the metal. You press down on the B to move forward into reverse or back into drive. One more click back takes you to manual mode. Yes, the Flying Spur has manual mode with these metal paddles on the steering wheel back that do have texture just to make them more special. Your surround view camera system is here. Front and rear views with grid lines for trajectory side view, super wide front and rear view, bird's eye view, very important not to scratch those 22 inch Mulliner spec wheels and you can clean the camera system at any time with that button. Oh, and it is thorough. That's spotless. Looking back in front of the driver, I'm gonna close up the door, show you the soft close. You shouldn't slam a door in a Bentley. And in front of the driver, we've got a digital gauge cluster that's, it's kind of old Audi tech here, and it, it works. It's not quite the visual impact I would perhaps expect at this price point. But you can change up the views. You can have map take over the center and right dial. Reconfigure it as you please. You get a head-up display as part of the first edition package. Look at this. The open pore leather around the rim of the steering wheel in Brunel with that linen interior and Brunel contrast stitch. This is really spectacular here. Leather around the airbag cover, metal B for Bentley, duotone leather up on the dashboard with contrast stitching. You get a first edition badge over there on the Grand Black Veneer. A real metal handle for your glove box that's pretty good sized. Moving on up to one touch cabin illumination and all the controls for your two, yes, two sunroofs with that first edition. Oh, I did want to show you the dampening for these cup holders because this is crazy. It, it glides silently. No creaking. Look at the thickness of this piece too. That is this right here, the silence of this is this car and it is luxury leather for the sliding center armrest too. And with that, let's go see the rear seats and what they've got for us. It's gonna be good. Watch the soft close of the front doors from the outside. Mm. And in the back, the same linen and Brunel duotone leather and 3D effect to the leather in Brunel now, not linen like the front. The leather does extend all the way down here and covers the speakers with a contrast stitch. All your seat controls are back here, four-way lumbar and massage. Yes, the rear seats get massage like the fronts in addition to heating and ventilation and the diamond quilted pattern and the first edition embroidery. Ooh, and these suede pillows. Illuminated tread plates like the front. And hopping on in, closing up this door gently. That's my driving position at six feet tall. You can see I can really stretch out back here. Plenty of knee room, all leather over the seat backs. 
This display here doesn't just stay there, you can eject it, or rather, present it. Grab like this, turn it over just to see the neural finishes for the handles. You can control a lot from this thing. Your climate controls, your seat settings, your lighting, including ambient light color, navigation system, and this is my favorite. I'm actually gonna get back out of the car to show you this. You can control the flying bee hood ornament from this display from outside the car. So let's go back here flying B, and let's say conceal. It's hard for me to stretch there. There we go. Bye-bye. And reveal. Yeah, it's a party trick, but it's just awesome. And I would do this for all my friends. I would have so many because I'd be so rich. When you're done with it, you can just slide it back in here. Wait, but one more trick to show before we move on. The blinds, which you can open or close all at one time to just hide in the back of your flying spur. That's pretty cool. Now, this flying spur is equipped with the five-seater configuration. Look at that, there's metal caps on your seat. I just noticed that. Metal on your seat belt covers. Or you can have a full center console this one just has this console that comes down. It's pretty big. It just gently damps down with a leather cover for cup holders and knurled finish for the opener to the console where you have two USB-A ports and a knurled finish for your DC socket. Because why not in your flying spur? And this just clicks into place back there. The back seats are very nice. And the vanity just kind of seals the deal for me. Mm, one touch LED illumination back here too. Yeah, it's good, it's good. I'm just, I'm like noticing more details back here. This is the backwards B of Bentley that's just artfully designed into the handle. It's wild, it's just wild guys. Wanna see the trunk just for a sec? There it is. It's huge. Hmm. I almost expected thicker carpeting. Ooh, DC sockets even damped. Yes, of course, metal for the tie down points. The trunk's big. I wanted thicker carpeting. That is the interior of the Bentley Flying Spur first edition V8. And that just means we've got one more thing to do. It's the big bottle test. If I can get my big bottle, where is it? There it is, okay. I'm gonna do this very gently. Will it fit in the front cup holders? Nope, not in there. Door pocket? Well, kinda do that, door test. Will it stay? No, it won't. And that, that's kind of it. There's no center console here, so it fails the big bottle test. I'm sad to say. Now it's time to rev it up. Ooh, actually, we're going to rev up the W12 first and take that one for a drive first. That sounds good to me. And guys, if you've been enjoying this review so far, please like, comment, and subscribe. That would be great. To the W12. Well, you know, we gotta do a launch control, even though there is no launch control system. I'm gonna go to sport mode and then just put my foot down and see what happens. Ready? Here it goes. Ha <laughs> ha, no, no, and we're there. <laughs> that was the most unremarkable and yet astonishing launch I, I may have ever done. Why? Because apart from the numbers on the gauge cluster, you would have no, and the G-Force, okay, G-Force, you would have no indicator that this thing just crushed a zero to 60 time about as quick 
as a low-level supercar. 0 to 60, 3.6 seconds, says Bentley. Car and driver got low three seconds. I feel like that was low three seconds. That was absurd. And so quiet. And so Bentley. The cabin insulation, the, the W12 engine almost like yawning its way to 60. I'm going to take it out of sport mode because we, we don't need that anymore. Bentley mode. That, that, sounds, that sounds about right for this car. Just threw me forward in the gentlest way possible. No hesitation from that twin turbo engine. No slip at all from those tires. 315, 315 section rear rubber really helps. And an all-wheel drive system certainly helps to quell the chaos of 626 horsepower and 664 pound-feet of torque from a 6-liter twin-turbocharged W12 engine, basically two V6s just patched up together. I am floored by just how, how effortless it made that feel. And now we're just cruising. The seat just cosseting me. The suspension just smoothing out all the road's undulations. Let's see how this turning radius is. Like it. Oh yeah. You can basically feel the rear wheels turning in the opposite direction of the front, the rear wheel steering system at play here to make a 17 foot long car turn like that. I love that technology. I know it's on other vehicles, but it, it's so good to use it here. Oh, I'm at ease. And usually, I, I mean, I just like, I get giddy after doing launches like that. Doesn't matter how many times I do it. I get giddy when I'm doing a low three second launch, but in this car, I'm just like instantly back at calm. The, the tension in my shoulders is gone. There is, of course, a lot at play here to make me feel so at ease. We have the big displacement, high displacement engine that just gets to be lazy all the time. An excellent eight-speed automatic gearbox that gently transitions between gears. The ride quality from this adaptive suspension with a blanketing of air suspension on top of that, that as I've experienced is effectively like a game of whack-a-mole because you see a bump come up and it just pummels it back down. Like, you will not disturb these passengers not going to happen today. You've got that. You've got the incredible cabin insulation. All these just meld together into this tranquil driving experience that I guess we'll have to see if the V8 can match. Obviously, it'll have three out of four of those components, but will the engine be as smooth? That's what I want to find out. But first, we got to see how this thing handles. But before we get to that, I want to spend another second talking about the ride quality of this car more in depth because when you're thinking about the competitors, the Rolls Royce Ghost, Mercedes Maybach S580, the new Maybach S580 I haven't driven yet, but when I think about the Rolls Royce Ghost and how that coasted down the road, it, it rather floated. It, they, they say, you know, the magic carpet ride, whatever, that means it was in very, in, in a lot of senses, disconnected from the drive. And the flying spur is not that. It pummels down those imperfections, as I said, to the point that they're not disturbing the occupants, but you still feel tied to the road in ways that the ghost does not. That must be a very loud truck because I can actually hear it and you can't hear anything else in this vehicle. It, it still feels like I'm driving the car. It still feels like I am connected. But how connected? Let's find out with a test of handling and braking. Hard on those brakes there. Some dive, but not too bad. And then, so stable through the corner. It really controlled its body motions well, and that's without the available electronic active anti-roll bars. That is impressive. And there was good feedback through the wheel too. Not like I was had ultra sensitivity to it, but the resistance and the buildup through the rack was nicely dialed. 
that was actually kind of fun. And now let's switch it to manual mode. We'll do a couple mid-range pulls here. Downshifts are relatively quick. Ho, ho, ho! Mercy me! Yeah, quick shift. And a huge wave of power. <laughs> there you can hear those twin turbos. Wow. That is a force right there. All right, so it can handle, and we know it can blast blast off, so that's what you get with the W12, huh? Well, we're going to have to see where that V8 chimes in. We are going to have less weight, and most likely a throw to your soundtrack. But let's switch on over, rev it out, see what happens. <laughs> And of course, as soon as I hopped out of the W12, I realized that the Flying Spur does in fact have a launch control system. It's just not labeled. So you go to sport mode, just like we did before, except what I didn't do was hold my foot down, give it gas, it holds at 4,000 and then you go. And you're there. Uh, huh. <laughs> I imagine that in the W12, that would have been pretty raucous. In the V8, that was amazing because now, unlike the W12, we've got an engine note and it sounded pretty darn good. I, I think that was what's, I was really missing that from the W12 because even though you had this wave of power that just kind of crashed over you as you surged forward, you didn't have the engine note to go with it. Now with that four liter twin turbo V8, as you are blistering forward, and honestly, I'm gonna say that with launch control, this was just as quick as that W12 without launch control, though with launch control, the W12, I'm certain would have been quicker. I think uh, this car, Bentley says 4.0 seconds to 60. Independent tests have seen quicker. That feels like it. Four liter twin turbo V8 makes 542 horsepower and 568 pound-feet of torque. It feels every bit of it. And with the V8, you're losing out on 220 pounds compared to the W12. And it's not just 220 pounds off the car in general, it's 220 pounds off the nose. So that means here, there is noticeably less front end dive and the rear end doesn't over lighten as it come into the corner. So I can put the power down more stably. Is that a word? Stably? I don't know, but it's what I'm feeling. And now in the same spot as I did it for the W12, we'll go into manual mode and see the mid range power. Oh. Whoa. Wow. Wow. I mean, I, it could just be the noise that makes me feel like it's just as fast as the W12. It probably is, all right? The W12 just on paper making that much more power, but this is tremendous thrust. I expected, especially on an uphill like that, to feel more of a difference in the mid-range pack, but this doesn't feel like it gives much, if anything, up to the W12. And I mean, just to test a theory here, let's go back to Bentley. Let's go to comfort mode one more. I felt like as I've been driving the V8 around that there wasn't the sizable difference that I expected that come with four additional cylinders in terms of the smoothness of the operation of the engine. It feels like it's the same car. That's... That's a feat. That is a feat. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. All right, one more test that I have up ahead. We're gonna do one more corner and we're gonna play out the one extra piece that this V8 has as an option over that W12 and that is the electronic active anti-roll bars. 
All right, so back to sport, and let's hit it. Hard on those brakes. Oh yeah, you can feel it instantly from the turn-in. Look at this rotation here. Just trying to make the car misbehave, but it doesn't do it. So, I mean, you can feel the stability control system, which I had left on there, cutting in to cut the power. But mostly what I was feeling in that instance back there is the sharpness of the turn-in and the plantedness of the car through the corner that I know is tied to the fact that this car has those electronic active anti-roll bars. It makes a huge difference and the fact that I'm without that extra weight of the W12, it just makes it that much more enjoyable to do things like that. Here on the highway, where you are most likely gonna spend a lot of your time behind the wheel of the Flying Spur, it, it doesn't really matter, V8 or W12. Smooth ride, great cabin insulation, some available active safety features like adaptive cruise control and lane keep assist, both which work fine, neither of being the, the most cutting edge technologies it's not a perfect lane centering system as an example but they're there and they make this uh this vehicle which it's already lending itself with the comfort and the power to being a great grand tour even more enjoyable with those safety technologies but now let's get into it do you want the v8 do you want the w12 the price differential is twenty two thousand dollars which if you're spending around two hundred thousand dollars on a car, that's a rounding error to you. You don't really care. It's more like, which do you prefer? And I'll tell you this, if you're gonna be spending a lot of your time behind the wheel and you like the sound of the V8, I don't think it's worth the 22 grand for the W12. I understand it's a prestige thing, you got the big boy, and there is a bit of extra smoothness from that W12 and there is a little extra sense of just raw power that again that's swelling up so I'm gonna say V8 for me turning our attention to the competitors we've got the new Rolls-Royce Ghost and it's <laughs> price wise not even in the same ballpark it's more than a hundred thousand dollars more expensive than the W12 it's three hundred and thirty two thousand dollars to start and what you're getting from that is a level of elitism even beyond the flying spur, which is, it's hard to imagine if you've never been in the two cars and you've never kind of just looked at how people look at the car, but it's just another transcending level of authority. On top of that, it's... Rolls Royce's magic carpet ride quality. And I can't believe we're gonna hit a bunch of traffic right now. It's Rolls Royce's magic carpet ride quality, which is just unparalleled. You are floating everywhere you go. That stands for something. The power in that car is 563 horsepower. It's between the V8 power and the W12 power. Top speed's limited to 155 in that car. I didn't mention the top speed in the V8 is 198 miles per hour. The top speed in the W12 is 207. It is the fastest production sedan you can buy right now, even beating out the Charger Hellcat Red Eye at like 205. That's nuts. The Rolls Royce is incredible. It's a ride quality machine. It is in my opinion, worth the money if you're gonna spend a lot of your time in the back seat. Let's think about another competitor now. One I haven't driven in the Maybach specific version, the new Mercedes Maybach S580 and S680. The 580 is more rival to the V8 in terms of power uh, and price at like 185,000. The S680 is more a rival of the W12 in terms of price and power and performance. 
Not having driven the Maybach version, but having driven the regular S-Class, I can tell you this, the technology in that car is just gonna blow away anything that Bentley or Rolls-Royce is gonna put out there. The ride quality is really very good. The performance is also really very good. I can't, not having driven the Maybach, I can't say definitively which one is best, but I can say that the driving experience in the Flying Spur, along with this kind of just wow fact that you get with the car, is going to be hard to beat. It's hard to imagine that this vehicle could actually reward a driver when you look at it and you look at the specs and then you, you get a ride in it and you feel like, man, this is incredibly comfortable, but it's actually kind of fun to drive. It's fun to drive. And it delivers the luxury. And it delivers the look in the right color combo. This interior with uh, that, uh, that blue exterior that I mentioned, <laughs> sign me up, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this in-depth review. Please like, comment, and share it, and I will see you again next time.